happy to be here tonight. It's, you know, one of the best things about being a doctor is actually the patient encounters. You know, I tell people that the real privilege of being a doctor is that you get to meet a patient every day as if you had known them their entire life. People come in, they tell, tell you their life stories, and that's really the privilege of what we do. Um, so I'm going to go through this talk. I, you know, you guys took time out this evening, so I want it to be worth your time. I've actually never given a talk like this before, so I put some thought into it. And the way I figured is that if you wanted to just get a very superficial knowledge of this stuff, you can just go to the internet and learn this stuff. So I'm actually going to give a talk, and I'm actually going to use some of the slides that I use to teach residents. And hopefully it would make it more interesting and you have a better insight on what we actually do. So my goals of this talk are really to help you guys, one, understand what we do as a spine surgeon, two, clarify some of the myths around it, but at least give you guys some nuggets on, okay, these are the conditions of the cervical spine where you actually see a spine surgeon, and these are the conditions that you'd actually see some other type of doctor. So when you leave here, hopefully you have like a 30,000 foot view of the conditions of the cervical spine. Now, um, I'm gonna tell a tiny bit of a personal story. So here, I tell patients all the time in clinic, we do three things as a doctor. First, we make a diagnosis, then you decide a treatment among many treatment options, and then you do the stuff that we love to do, which is you just do it, the carpentry. You actually do the operation. Now, if you don't make the diagnosis right, you're not gonna cho make, choose the right treatment. And if you don't choose the right treatment, chances are you're gonna do the wrong operation. So I tell patients that most of the time patients have a bad outcome from surgery, it's because somebody fumbled that first step. What is the diagnosis? Now the funny thing is about our medical society, which is very different than other countries, we get paid to do the treatment. So we actually aren't incentivized to put a lot of time into making an accurate diagnosis because we want to get to the fun stuff, which is do the treatment. And I think that's why in our country in particular, there's a lot of misdiagnosis and it's a much higher misdiagnosis rate than other countries. Um, the kind of personal story from that is when I was a fellow, I had all this leg pain. And I was a fellow, I'm like, you know, why am I having this pain? And I went to see the doctors and there are all these pressures, these are my mentors. So it turned out I had two operations on my knee and I didn't get better. At that point, I'm like, forget it, I'm not seeing a doctor. It's like, this is, every time I go there, they recommend surgery and it doesn't help. And years later, I finally w went to see a physical therapist and within five minutes, I'm on the table, she's like, well, you know, you have hip dysplasia, right? So it took a physical therapist five minutes to diagnose that I actually had dysplasia in the hip and I had two operations by the world's most experts on my knee on the wrong joint. So, you know, years later I got a hip replacement and I feel great, but I go back and I think, how is it that these experts made the wrong diagnosis? You know, I think there's different answers to that and I'm biased, but I think the biggest thing is that our medical society is based on specialization. And she just mentioned this website called orthobolus.com. I do a, a lot of education for residents all over the world. Every year, I give a talk to essentially every graduating orthopedic resident sitting for the boards, and I present a lot of the slides that you're gonna see here. Our medical system is so specialized that our universe becomes one thing. And they say, what's that expression? If you're, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So if you're a knee surgeon, all the pain in the knee is coming from the knee. If you're a hand surgeon, everything's a peripheral nerve. So we lose our diagnostic breath because it's not our fault. We don't mean to misdiagnose stuff. We just become so, so f specialized that we just miss the diagnosis because we don't see it on a regular basis. So anyhow, I think that's important as I go through these slides. Um, so at 30,000 feet in our world, there's two types of conditions. Things get better. So if you get the flu, it stinks, but you know it's gonna get better. You know, there's a lot of medical conditions that we get if you cut yourself. It's a bummer, but you know it's gonna heal. So when you think of all the conditions we have, there's conditions that improve with time, and then conditions that don't get better. 
Now, the important thing is that if it's something that improves with time and Mother Nature is going to heal it, you want to avoid seeing the doctor <laughs> because you want it to get better on its own or at least do non-operative treatment. Now, there are conditions that you don't want to miss, and now we're going to talk about a few of those today. So there are certain conditions that you want to see a doctor sooner than later because if you diagnose it early, you can actually improve the outcome by having treatment sooner than later. Um, so I'm going to go through this discussion. I'm going to break it down into those two types, improves with time, worse with time, and then I'm just going to use this anatomic breakdown and think about the things in the neck. Obviously, we have muscles, we have bones, we have the intervertebral disc, we have nerves, and we have the spinal cord. And uh, so when I approach this, first I'm going to talk about arthritis and disc degeneration, and then we're going to move on and talk about the pinched nerve, the disc herniation. You guys probably all know the term disc herniation. Then I'm going to move on to kind of my favorite topic, and I think something that is important because it's often misdiagnosed, which is cervical myelopathy, which is a compression of the spinal cord. It's the one condition that is always misdiagnosed by primary care physicians in the community, and I often see those patients thinking, I wish I had seen this patient earlier. I could have done a better job if somebody had brought this patient into my office sooner, and I'll explain why that never happens. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, bo the, the bumps and the bruises, the fractures, and a condition called central cord syndrome. And then finally, we're going to end up on this thing called neck pain or neck sprain or whiplash. It can be traumatic or it can be acute. And that's really the condition that I'm going to save it to last because even though it's the most benign of these conditions, it's the hardest one for me to have in front of me because it's hard for me to understand what it is. I don't have a good treatment option. For the, so those people that have that chronic neck pain, they often leave the office with a bad feeling, and I leave the office with a bad feeling. And it's not because we don't want to help, it's just one of those areas where we don't have a clear understanding of it, so we're just not good at doing it. And if you're not good at something, it's something you kind of want to avoid doing. So we're going to actually save that neck sprain or neck pain for last. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy, arthritis. So this is the cervical spine. So everybody just look here. So the one thing the cervical spine does is let's rotate left and right. Now all that motion of rotation comes from the top of the cervical spine, C1, C2. The way that joint works, it's my favorite joint in the body. We call it that atlantal axial joint just because it connects the base of the skull to the cervical spine. Now, we have some important things in the brain, right? <laughs> in the skull. You have the brain. The brain requires a lot of oxygen. It's very heavy. And at the same time, look at all the motion it gives us. So that joint at the base of the skull is actually the most fascinating joint in the body because it has so much function it needs to do. And it basically works like a, it has C2 is just a peg and C1 is a washer that sits on top of it. Your skull sits right on top of that washer. So that's where you get all that rotation in the cervical spine. Now as you come down to these other levels, in the lower spine, C2, C3, all the way down to C7, that's your workhorse. It's C5, 6, and C6, 7 that does all the work over time. And that's where you get all your lateral bend and all your flexion extension. So all your rotation comes from the upper cervical spine right at the base of the skull, and all that other motion comes through those different joints. Now, if you guys all wanted to pick up this table right here and move it out, you know, what would you do? It's that much easier if you all pick it up at once. So that's why we have all these different vertebral bodies, because they distribute the workload. And that's why, if I mention the dreaded word for a spine surgeon, fusion, the, b the bad thing about the fusion, is a, although it's a great operation, is it takes out one of the segments that moves. So if you picture the analogy of moving that table, if one person gets up and leaves, that means everybody else has to do more work. And that's why whenever you fuse something in the cervical spine, it causes an increased workload at the levels above and below. So those just ex degenerate that much faster and that's why we get this thing called adjacent segment disease. So there's a lot of, you know, you know, myth around, you know, basically spinal fusion has a very bad reputation 
and it mainly comes from that problem of this adjacent level disease. And we've learned a lot about it in the last 10 years. We're much better at treating it. But the, the secret is you avoid fusion whenever you can, and you especially avoid it in younger patients because that degeneration in the adjacent segment is just progressive over time. So if you have to live 60 years, that's 60 years of work on that one level, and it's going to deteriorate. So what she's talking about is the natural curve of the spine. So if you picture me from the side, we all have lordosis in the lumbar spine, then your thoracic spine bends over, and your neck is lordotic again. This whole thing is aimed at keeping your head over your pelvis. So picture a golf ball sitting on a tee. If you move that golf ball off so it's hanging off that, you have to use all this energy to keep it on it where if it's balanced on top of that T, it just sits there not using any balance. So that's why it's so important to maintain that posture, keeping your head over your body and having that lordosis. The problem is, you know, we all have wrinkles on our skin. We all get old despite the fact that we don't want to. So the process of getting old is losing that lordosis. And this is the natural aging process. If you look at me, as a kid, we run around like this, and over time, we lose the lordosis, and the head starts to come forward, and we hunch over. And the reason that happens is because of this motion segment. So if you look at the motion segment, you have a vertebral body here, and between it, you have the disc space. And the disc space keeps that space between those motion segments. And the disc actually acts as a joint, and then you have two joints on the side. So picture these chairs. These chairs all have four legs. But picture a stool. A stool has three legs. The disc up front is the first leg. This is the second leg. And that's the third leg. So they all work together to act as a joint. Now the, that joint up here, the disc, it's basically like a nice juicy tire on your car. You know, it has a firm outer thing, which is a firm rubber on the outside. But the inside of it's filled with, it's kind of like jelly. And that gives that cushion to your spine and maintains the height. The problem is that jelly is a very complex molecule and it contains a lot of water. And the same process by which you develop wrinkles, it's basically your body losing water content. And what happens in the disc is that you lose that height. Now these joints here are supposed to be a certain distance apart from each other. But if that disc gets lower and lower and lower, what happens to these joints on the side? They have more axial load because they're coming down on top of each other, so they start developing arthritis. So this process is the natural aging process. So we call it, you know, disc bulging is a natural aging process. Loss of disc height is a, lot, is a normal aging process. And this is what it looks like on an x-ray. So you had mentioned this, this is what we're getting to. This is a young person's spine. So you have all this disc height. Because that disc height is there, think of this as building blocks. They're stacked on top of each other. You got bone, disc, bone, disc, bone, disc. That creates the height, so you have this lordosis. Over time, that disc loses the water content and it drops down. So you can see here, you've lost your disc height. You've lost your disc height. This one still has it. This is, unfortunately, the natural aging process. The problem is when you do that, these joints in the back have more load, more weight on them because the disc isn't working. So they start developing these osteophytes. So this is this normal aging process that we have in the spine. So you can see here that if you lose that disc height here, by definition, that anterior column is going to get shorter. So you're going to go from lordosis into a kyphotic state. And that's just because it's not your posture. It's not what you're doing. It's just because that jelly in those discs is losing that water content, that shock absorber, and it's collapsing down. Now, is there anything we can do for that to stop it? No. You know, it, it, it's as inevitable as the process of aging. You know, and obviously there's lots of things you can do to keep your healthy. But, you know, I have my landlord. He's, he's, he's the same age as me, and he's running marathons. And I had my hip replaced at 47. You know, where's the, where's the fairness in that? The point being is that he was just born with better cartilage and better water content. 
he's just maintaining that. Yeah. So there are things, and I don't want to say that this is like just going to happen and there's nothing you can do, because in the anterior column, there's the bone. Now we know that you can keep that bone strong. You know, exercise, calcium, there's a whole bunch of things you can do to keep that bone strong. So you can either lose height in the disc, or you can also lose height in that bone by the bone collapsing down. So, you know, unfortunately we don't have, to our knowledge, great tools to keep the disc healthy, but we have great tools and great understanding of good bone health, so make sure you take care of it. All right, so I think we talked a little bit about arthritis. Now, another thing I want to kind of tell you about my job is that there's a lot of things out there that I just can't fix. And it's like, it, it just, you, I, I, I just had to tell patients, I'm, you know, I, I wish I could help you, but I just can't. And that's, you know, one of my mentors told me that, like, don't be afraid to say that. Don't mislead patients thinking that you have a solution to make them better just because there's a lot of things in life that just aren't fair, you know, and I just don't want to mislead patients. Now, one thing that is my job is to make sure we don't miss something bad, you know, and because you come to me trusting me, and if I tell you this is something you have to live with or it's not very serious or it's nothing critical, I just have to be right. So I just, as I go through this, Going back to that first slide of making the diagnosis first, a big part of what I'm doing is trying to filter out, okay, is there something dangerous here? You know, obviously the stuff that starts with a C, the cancer word. I need to make sure that because a lot of cancer spreads to the spine. So I have to make sure there's nothing there. The biggest, scariest thing is infections in the neck. Anybody who's a diabetic or, you know, I don't think it's this patient population, but IV drug use, every night on call, I'll get five or six people coming into the emergency room with severe neck pain, wanting narcotic medications. It's so easy just to be like, oh, this is nothing. But if I miss an infection, an epidural abscess in the spine, within 24 hours, somebody could be paralyzed. So we always have to be thinking, what are the really bad things that we could miss? Because that's when you do a disservice to the patient. You miss the thing that you were supposed to identify as a specialist. Um, so this is, you know, this concept of red flags. And so, you know, for arthritis, it's really infection that we really need to think about. So treatment, I think we just talked about this. So it's about staying active. So for arthritis, once stuff stops moving, it's harder to get it moving again. So the more active you can be, and that's the thing that's so wonderful about being in the West Coast, California, it's like people are so active you know, and it's just a wonderful thing. And in California, I swear, the reason people stay so active is because the weather's so good, they're just out doing stuff. And if you remain active, you know, it can, you can stay active for a much longer period of time. All right, so let's go on to that degenerative process. So we talked about it. You lose the disc height, then you start getting osteophytes on those joints. Those osteophytes, osteophytes start growing towards the nerve root and the spinal canal. So going back, there's the 101, which is the spinal canal, which is the serious stuff, and the nerve roots, which is the exit, which isn't nearly as serious. So I've, I kind of use this analogy. So again, the green is the spinal cord. You know, just picture that horrible patient, dove into a swimming pool, spinal cord injury, paralyzed, and we know they don't ever get better, for the most part. Where if you pinch this nerve out here, how many people in this room have had severe arm pain or leg pain at some point in their life? You know, so 80% of all individuals before they go, you know, end of life, will have an episode of nerve pain. Sciatica, we call it in the lower extremities, pinched nerve. It's when you have pain rating down the arms. I had it for a year. The beautiful thing is that 80, 95% of those get better on their own. So that's one of those things that get better if you just leave it alone. It's, it's one of the worst pains you can have. It, it chews you up, like, you know, arthritic pain is easy. I had my hip replaced, like, but the nerve pain, there's just no relief. You can't sit down, you can't sleep, and that's why nerve pain, you know, is so tough for people to deal with. So again, this is the spinal cord. Now, the spinal cord is the 101. This is something that doesn't regenerate. The spinal cord does two things. It sends the motor signals down to your foot. So right now, my brain's saying, move your foot, and my foot's moving, and right now, I'm touching 
it and a signal is going up and I'm hearing it in the brain. So that's what the spinal cord does. It sends signals back and up to make everything work. Now, I don't have any slides on it, but one of the big advents to what we do is this thing called spinal cord monitoring. So whenever I operate around the spinal cord, I have little electrodes in people's heads and a little electrodes in people's muscles down here, and we're constantly sending signals up those blue and those red pathways. And that means if we hit the spinal cord, if it's unhappy because we move something, it goes bing, 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 bing. So we have very good technology to make sure when we operate, we don't injure the spinal cord. Scoliosis surgery in children. You know, now it used to be that this was considered a luxury to have spinal cord monitoring during that operation. Now it's considered a standard of practice, meaning that you would never do deformity surgery on a kid unless you do this monitoring because it's so effective at protecting the spinal cord while we're operating. So we talked about this a little bit. So this is the intervertebral disc. The disc is basically, think of it as a jelly donut. The outside of it is very firm, very strong, just like your tire. The inside of it, it kind of looks like crab meat when we pull it out. When you're young, it, has, it just looks like jelly. It has this firm, lot of water content in it. And as you get older, that's the part that desiccates. Um, so this is that disc space, so it goes bone, disc, bone. These are building blocks, and as you lose that disc space, that anterior column collapses down. So this is what the nerves look like in the cervical and lumbar spine. So in the cervical sp spine, these are the major nerves that we deal with, C6, C7, C8, T1. Those are the vertebral bodies. So when we talk about nerves or levels in the spine, you talk about the five, six level, the six, seven level. So I talk to a lot of patients and they hear, oh, it was four or it's five, and it's just a matter of nomenclature. But the motion segment itself includes a vertebral body, the disc, and the other vertebral body. So in our world, we talk about a level as C4-5 or C5-6 and so forth. At each level, you can see those nerve roots traveling out under that nerve root. Again, this is the 101, the spinal cord, and these are those nerve roots that come out. Now, when you have a disc herniation, that disc comes out and hits that nerve root. It's the same thing down here in the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine's a little bit different because the nerves travel downwards and then go out. Picture the, the shape of the off-ramp, where in the cervical spine, they just go straight out. So that's how it looks. Now this is kind of a, a more you know, artistic rendition of what it looks like. So this is looking straight down the spinal canal. This is the spinal cord. This is the disc above it. So if that disc herniates, it's going to either hit the spinal cord or the nerve root. So when you have a disc herniation, that's that outer layer of the disc. That's the jelly in the mi middle. In order for that disc material to come out, you have to have a tear in the annulus. So the annulus is that outer ring, it's that firm material. So if you have a disc herniation, first you have a tear in the annulus. Now, has anybody had a disc herniation in their low back? You know, do they remember it happening? Usually you hear a pop, and that's that tear in the annulus. That's that pressure pushing through that annulus. Now, a lot of times you just hear that pop or that bang, and then you have severe pain right in your back. And that's when you have that annular tear. Now, usually that heals with time. The question is, does the disc material start squirting out? If the disc material starts coming out and comes the, to this nerve root, suddenly you go from having back pain to arm pain. Uh, I'm talking about the lumbar spine. You go from having back pain to pain radiating down your leg. In the neck, you hear a lot of neck, you'll hear a bang, you have a lot of pain in your neck, and then maybe a few days later, you start feeling something in your arm. And that's because that disc material is coming out and has started to hit that nerve root and it's causing those symptoms. So this is a concept that we kind of just take it for granted. But your nerves start from here and go down your arms, go down your legs. Now, as I said, the purpose of those nerves is to carry signals out and motor signals out and pain back. And that's why if you pinch the nerve here, you feel it all the way down in the arm. And that's kind of this kind of strange concept that, wait a minute, the pathology is up here, yet I have numbness and tingling in my thumb. 
and that's just how it works. And you can really think of it as a garden hose in your garden, where you know if you have a, a, a plug up here, you don't see water down there because it's just a pathway. Um, all right, so let's talk about this condition of a pinched nerve in the neck. Now, a pinched nerve in the neck is when you start having pain that radiates down your arm. A lot of times you just have it in your shoulder. A big part of what I do is try to tease out whether the pain is a pinched nerve in the neck or if it's just rotator cuff pathology. How many people here have had uh, surgery on their shoulder for rotator cuff? How many people here have difficulty at some point lifting their arms above their head? Yeah. So that's rotator cuff pathology. Now it's, <laughs> it's really easy to diagnose rotator cuff pathology because you can't sleep on it at night. That's the big difference. If you have tendonitis or some type of rotator cuff pathology, you can't sleep on it. Now, if you're a back sleeper or a stomach sleeper, you won't know, but a lot of us are slide, side sleepers, and if they come to me and say, I can't sleep because I wake up with shoulder pain, I tell them, you're seeing the wrong doctor. You really need to be seeing a shoulder expert. Um, but anyhow, so that's how a radiculopathy presents. It's unilateral arm pain. If somebody, if you have a fender bender on the south exit coming off the 101, is it affecting the people on the other exit on the other side? No. So a pinched nerve only affects one arm, and that's just how the plumbing works in the arm, and that's how we know it and can separate it from some other things. Now, how does it happen? As we said, it's this disc herniation, or it can be the osteophytes pinching that nerve. Now this is what it looks like on an MRI. This is looking down an illustration. Again, this is the spinal cord, this is the nerve, this is the disc. We're not seeing the bone because the bone's under it and we just cut it. This is what it looks like on an MRI. This is the spinal cord. That's fluid around the spinal cord. It's very important so the body always protects it and has it surrounded in fluid. And this is that exit. That's the seaward exit coming out here. And that's a disc herniation that came out of there and is sitting that nerve root. You can see that this distance here, that nerve is fine, but this nerve is getting hit by that disc herniation, and that patient would presenting, be presenting with that arm pain. So how many people here have had a cervical radiculopathy? So about, no? I'm surprised. About 50% of all surgeons and dentists, half of us, at some point in our career had to take on, time off because we get a cervical radiculopathy. It's because we just spend our life like this, looking down. So cervical radiculopathy is really easy. Well, it's not easy to diagnose, but it's, it's pretty easy compared to some other things because we have these things called dermatomes. So if a patient comes in to me and says, oh, I hurt, hurt my neck playing rugby or something, and I have numbness in my thumb, and they're sitting there, they're like holding their thumb, we know that's the C6 nerve root. If it's C7, it's these two fingers here. So it's very easy to diagnose it. Now the other thing that we look for is that the motor associated with it. So here you can see these are dermatomes that go with the nerve root. The other thing that happens is that it affects the muscles. So if I come up to a patient, go ahead, put your arm out like this, I say push down. So this is triceps. If she's weak there, I know that's the C7 nerve root. Now pull the, your hand up towards your mouth. Now this is her bicep, so we know that's C5. So the cool thing about cervical radiculopathy is a lot of time I don't even need an MRI because I know what the diagnosis is based on how it presents. And uh, anyhow, so that's, that's what we do on physical exam. Now one thing about cervical myelopathy is that it's a nerve going from here to here. So obviously if I bring my hand up here, it's like the nerve is relaxing. Where if I go like this, I'm actually pulling tension on it. So there's a, what we call tension signs where I can actually stretch that nerve by moving the head this way and pulling the arm that way, and that's gonna create the pain in the thumb because we're just pulling on that nerve root around the compression. And this is all the fun stuff that we get to do when we make a physical exam. All right, so when you come in, let's look at some x-rays. You know, so when people come in, usually they get an x-ray. If somebody comes in with a pinched nerve, then we get this thing called oblique views. So you see here, that's the frame, and that's where that nerve is coming off the 101, and that's the exit. And you can see down at this level here, 
that's that joint. So we've lost disc height, so that pressure goes through these joints here and here, and they start encroaching on that door where the nerve comes out. And that's when you start pinching on that nerve, and that's how you get a radiculopathy. So we'll get x-rays if you came in the office to look at this stuff. Usually we end up getting an MRI, just because we get so much information on them, and it just helps us make that diagnosis. So whenever we look at an MRI, this is your brain, and then this is the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord, because it's such valuable material, is always surrounded by CSF. So that white stuff you see is just the fluid surrounding the spinal cord. And this is just a cross section, but if you looked at it from the top, it just looks like uh, it's surrounded by fluid. So here, this is your spinal cord. This area is happy because it's surrounded by fluid. Go back to that garden hose analogy. If there's water in the garden hose, picture I have a finger inside the garden hose, surrounded by water, and then I put a ring clamp around it. What's going to happen? It's going to push the water up and down, but it's going to squeeze my finger in the middle of it. So when you have compression, you push that CSF out. So here, that analogy, your question about spinal stenosis. I, I, <laughs> in, in medicine, we, we have this thing called a pimp culture, where we go through training, and people are always asking you questions in front of large groups of people to see if you know it and to basically you know, humiliate you. So I have this habit of asking people questions in front of large groups, which I think is a little bit unfair. But here, the question is, do you have spinal stenosis there? If you had spinal stenosis, you'd have a ring clamp around this whole thing squeezing so you wouldn't have any of that CSF in there. Where here, you don't have spinal stenosis, you just have a disc herniation hitting one nerve root. And that's the difference between you know, myelopathy, which we'll talk about in a second, and radiculopathy, which is a pinched nerve. Um, so when it comes to cervical radiculopathy, 95% of these get better on their own. And the, the, you know, the, I know they're going to get better. The problem is the patient, when they have it, they're in so much pain, so miserable, they don't know it's going to get better. So it's a very easy victim to say, hey, I can make this better with surgery. But we know it's not the right thing to do. Yes, we can make them better in two weeks, and that patient's going to be hugging me. You made all this pain go away. But what that patient didn't know is if I didn't do anything, six weeks later, he would have been better. The other thing that, you know, orthopedics has seen so much evolution, you know, one thing we know now is it's not about what we do for the patient right now. My responsibility for the patient is to make him better over the duration of his life. So I need to be thinking about the longevity of any surgery I do. Yeah, I can make somebody's pain go away for cervical, dic uh, cervical radiculopathy, but if I lead to adjacent segment disease that causes hidden problems in 20 years, I didn't do him any favors, especially if he would have gotten better on his own. So, you know, it's very important to recognize these conditions that get better on their own. So, a pinched nerve in the neck is something that usually resolves on its own. How many people here have ever taken a, or I, I won't do that again, gabapentin? I took it for a year. It, it is the cheapest, it's not 100%, it's very safe, but it does have some side effects. But it is extremely effective at taking nerve pain, an acute nerve pain, bringing it down several levels just to give Mother Nature her time to fix this on her own. So we have a lot of treatment options between medications, epidural steroid injections. Has anybody ever had an epidural steroid injection? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I honestly think I'm going to start doing these injections. I don't do them, but the pain doctors provide so much lasting relief. And in my mind, I really believe that most patients, especially with a pinched nerve, they need to get these injections. Do them three, four, five, six times because they do work. And if they can get you from not having surgery, yes, my, my operation will work better faster. The problem is my operation has problems 10, 20 years later. So if you can avoid the operation, avoid the fusion, you do. I can make people really happy. I can, they see me you know, two weeks later, a month later. You know, they're so happy that they're out of pain. 
but the problem is the longevity of those operations, and that's why you try, always try things other than surgery first. Now, if we do do surgery, we have really good surgical treatment. Now, this is what we do in the neck. Now, for cervical radiculopathy, we need to get here. The problem is this is the spinal cord. Everybody says, oh, why are you doing an, an incision in the front? It's because we can't go around the spinal cord. You can't touch the spinal cord. So what we do is we use this little trap door. We take out the disc. The disc is the problem anyhow, herniated, right? It's a flat tire. So we just go in. If you guys have a flat tire on your car, usually what do they do? They just take the tire off and put a new one on. So what we do is we take the whole disc out. We use that as a trap door to get back to that nerve and decompress it. And this is what I do with the, the resin. I, I don't know if this is going to work, but everybody take your hand up and go straight up and down here. So go right midline and then come over to the side right here. And then squeeze in and push down and you'll feel a little space. And if you push all the way down, you can feel your spine. So right now, my finger is actually right on these bones right here. So my point being is that it is a very easy approach. You just go in, open it up, and you're right there. And that's why when we do these anterior spine surgeries, you make an incision about this big, you're in there, you know, you're looking at everything as opposed to lumbar spine where you're going through this hole and it's really deep to get down there. This is really operate easy operation. So what we historically did was would just go in there and then put a disc in there, take out the disc and fuse this level. The problem with this operation is that you take out that disc and if you take it out you have to replace that building block with something else. So we put a little piece of bone in there and then we do a fusion. Now this is Peyton Manning. He had this operation. He won a Super Bowl with it. It's an incredible operation. Your pain goes away immediately the only downside to it is that these guys kind of get the short end of the deal for the next 20 years because they had to start lifting the weight of the table from the person that just walked away. So you get adjacent segment disease. So, you know, if you're at an age later on in life, my age or older, usually 60 or later, these things aren't moving that much anyhow because you have arthritis. So taking out one of these motion segments and doing a fusion doesn't affect that person overall. But if it's a very young, young person, 20, 30 years old, if we do an operation at 20 or 30 in the cervical spine and we do a fusion, we're basically guaranteeing him that he's going to have to have surgery at the levels above or below before the end of his life. Now, if he has severe pain, it's a serious condition, a fracture, spinal cord injury, we do that. But if it's something that was going to get better on its own, we try to avoid it. Now, this is one thing that I am, you know, is really promising. So motion preserving surgery. So we just talked about what happens when you fuse that level. The levels above and below have to do this extra work. So wouldn't it be great instead of doing this, where you put in a cage, fuse it, and the levels and below have to do the extra work, if I could somehow just put something back in there that functioned like that disc? And we can. So now we do these disc replacements. So what this is actually is, is a little motion segment. It's like a little um, washer with a piece of plastic, a bearing in the middle. So these vertebral bodies continue to move. So this is a disc replacement. Now, disc replacements, like everything else in my profession, also had a bad name because somebody did them inappropriately for a period of time. So we used to do these disc replacements in the lumbar spine. People did them all the time, and they didn't work in the lumbar spine. The reason that they didn't work is because, you know, when I got my hip replaced, it's metal on poly, you know, because it has to bear all that weight. In the spine down here, these segments, they basically created a construct, and your spine is so heavy, has so much motion, the construct itself just couldn't carry the weight of the body. We couldn't come up with a biomechanical material that worked good, that did all the function of that disc. If you think of your hip joint, it's basically a ball and socket joint. It's very simple. Your disc material, that water solution, is just, it's just too complex that we couldn't reproduce to carry the weight of the lumbar spine. The fortunate thing up in the cervical spine 
is that you only have the weight of the head on top of it. You don't have the weight of everything else. So there, we were able to come up with an implant that is basically has the strength to do all the things that we need to do in the cervical spine. So these cervical disc replacements, you know, getting any new material on the market right now is really difficult through the FDA. So we now have more evidence on these implants than pretty much any other implant used. And when we talk about evidence, we talk about a prospective randomized clinical trial that's done on multiple medical centers that the, gover the government monitored to make sure that there isn't biases of surgeons, you know, basically thinking stuff works just because they like that. So here, for cervical disc replacements, it's a great option. And we know we have good evidence doing it. It gets around that problem of fusion. And anybody that's having a fusion, you know, in a certain patient population, I'm going to move towards this if it's an option, just because it doesn't create that adjacent level disease. So when we do this, you know, we're going in through the front. It's very easy, it's very close, but there are some scary things up there. You have your carotid arteries, you have your esophagus, so we just have to go between that plane. But it's, it's a pretty easy operation. I tell residents, like if you're feeling lost, you don't know where you are, just don't put anything sharp in there. <laughs> just do the dissection with your fingers and just keep going and pushing down. Like right now, you could do it right now and get down to it. And as long as you, you know, don't put something sharp in there and stay away from the carotid artery, everything should be fine. Um, and this is what it looks like coming down. This is your finger when we do it. This is, this is your back. This is your front of your neck here. This is your esophagus here. This is your larynx. That's some scary stuff there. That's your carotid. This is your spinal cord. And you just really come down that area. And this is, I remember I trained at a hospital for special surgery in New York, and Frank Camisa was this very famous spine surgeon. And he looked at me, and we were doing one of these operations, and he said, he said, if I could do this operation all day, every day, that would be my life. And it's just, it's just a fun, easy operation, and the patients do very well, and that's why we love doing these. Um, now, no matter what anybody tells you, every surgery has a complication rate. Complication rates are underreported. Like when I get a complication, which we all do, it's like, it's just a personal law. It's like a defeat. It's just like, it, it hurts your ego. It means you didn't do something right. So of course we don't want to tell other people about it. <laughs> we certainly don't want to publish it in the literature. So the problem is complications are dramatically underreported. So any surgery, and trust me, I've had, you know, how many surgeries? Every surgery I've had, had a complication. Every one. 100% complication rate. Even my total hip done recently, you know, I had a major complication. So going into any surgery, you need to know a complication. We're talking a 20% complication rate. Everybody thinks it's not going to happen to them, and there's bad ones and light ones, but you have to recognize that they're there. Because whenever you make a decision about surgery, you're weighing the pros versus the cons. And if anybody tells you there's no cons, they're not being straight with you. And it's, patients are fine having complications. We get through them, 99% of them you know, are just a few bumps in the road. But if they feel like everything was just gonna be slam, bam, up and easy, then their expectations are there. If you tell them, listen, there's a 20% chance something's gonna go wrong, it's not gonna be serious, it's not gonna affect the long-term outcomes, but be ready for it, then they're ready for it. You know? So it's really just a matter of setting the expectations for surgery. And usually, you know, I, I tell people that when we operate, how happy a patient is, is based on the delta improvement before the surgery and the afters the surgery. So if I operate on somebody that's when jogging the day before, is pretty happy, has a little bit of pain, it's very hard for me to make them better. And that's not somebody I want to operate on. And you shouldn't be operating on it. But patients that come to me, you know, they're not functioning. They can't walk. They can't move their arms. They can't sleep. So if you let people, if you operate on the right people with severe symptoms, then you're usually making them better. And people are really happy with what you do. Um, so that's why I tell anybody, if you're going to get a joint replacement, do what I did. It's like, wait and wait and wait to the point that you can barely walk, you're using a cane, because then you get the surgery and you're like, oh man, this is the best thing ever. It's like, you know, you can do all these things that you couldn't do before. 
So anyhow, complications of this operation. You know, one thing that we used to deal with is that the glue didn't heal between the bones. And the reason that used to happen is because of people smoking. Now, fortunately, people don't smoke that much anymore, so it usually doesn't happen. So it's actually much rare. This is also one of the really nice things about doing that disc replacement operation. If you're not trying to get the bones to heal together, you don't have to worry about the glue not taking. So with those arthroplasty procedures, you don't need to get that fusion, so you don't have to worry about that complication. You know, these are some other things when you're operating the spine, you know, other complications you can have. There's a bunch of nerves in there. There's a recurrent laryngeal nerve which controls your vocal cords. So whenever you have any type of anterior neck surgery, you have to be aware of the fact that it can change your voice and it can make it difficult to eat for a period of time. And those are complications that are associated with that surgery that you just need to be aware of. Dysphagia, it's very common. Essentially, any time you operate on the neck, people are gonna have difficulty swallowing for several weeks, but that usually resolves. And then again, this is this concept of this adjacent segment disease. So you can see here, that this is a fusion, and you can see that the level of above is already deteriorating because it had to do all that extra work. And that's just that adjacent segment disease that is a part of any lumbar surgery. Somebody said to get the other day in surgery there, like I think it was the rep, he's like every fusion brings on another fusion. There's this you know, bad joke for spine surgeons that you only need 100 patients in your, you only have to fuse 100 patients in your practice because you're gonna be reoperating on one of those patients every 10 years at the adjacent segment. It's a very bad joke, but it's very real. Lumbar fusion always leads to surgery at the adjacent levels, and that's the real downside of that operation. All right, so now I wanna move on to cervical myelopathy. Now, cervical myelopathy you know, cervical radiculopathy, the patients are in tons of pain. The primary care physician says, you gotta see this guy, he's in tons of pain, you have to operate on him. They get him in my clinic, I see this patient, I tell them, you're gonna hate me, but I'm gonna make you suffer, I'm gonna make you live with this and suffer for six weeks. Because you can get through this, and my job is to reassure you that this is eventually gonna go away. And the patients are unhappy, but they wait through it, the disc gets reabsorbed, they don't need surgery. A year later, they come back to me and say, thank you, Dr. Moore, everybody else was telling me to get surgery, you told me to hold off, I didn't need surgery and I'm happy because of it. Cervical myelopathy is the other condition. It gets worse with time. So cervical myelopathy is the condition, it's the com complete flip of that. I see patients in my office and I'm just like, why? didn't somebody diagnose this and refer it to my clinic sooner because it's the spinal cord, so it can't get better if I fix it. And I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but for cervical myelopathy, because it's the spinal cord and it doesn't regenerate, the level of neurologic deficits, the weakness, the dexterity problems that we'll have, I can make it a little bit better, but for the most part, I operate to keep it from getting worse. So that means if somebody's been getting worse for the last six months, a year, and somebody didn't diagnose it, and it comes to me and the patient already has pretty profound weakness, I can tell them, listen, I can keep you from getting weaker, but I can't guarantee you I'm gonna give you that strength back. And that's why I say to myself, if somebody had gone this patient in my office, you know, three months after it was diagnosed, I could have made this patient much better you know, return to a much higher quality of life. So that's the difference between myelopathy, which is the 101, the spinal cord, and a pinched nerve, which is the freeway exit. The spinal cord doesn't get better. Now, why do doctors, I mean, why do patients come to see doctors? Because they're in pain, right? Cervical myelopathy, who does it hap happen in? And I, I don't mean to, it, it's an older age bracket. So a lot of the people here are the people that are gonna be affected by cervical myelopathy. How does cervical myelopathy present? Well, let, let's go through what it is. Let's, so cervical myelopathy is just compression on the 101. Here you have the spinal cord. That's the fluid around it. Do you place up here where there isn't a bright white line behind the spinal cord? Yeah, it's easy right here. That's cervical myelopathy and you start getting that white stuff in the spinal cord. Now. How does that present, you know, or what causes it? Anything that compresses on it causes it. This is obviously a tumor. 
Uh, this is an infection that you don't want to miss. In that if, you're, if you're diabetic and you ever get acute neck pain, you see a doctor because you could have an infection brewing in here and we had to get to it quickly. It only happens in diabetics and IV drug users. But those two risk factors, anybody that has severe onset of neck pain, they need an MRI. This is uh, in the Asian population. This is called OPLL. And this is just osteophyte formation of a, a disc back there. What's it doing? It's compressing that spinal cord, what's in the middle. So that is what cervical myelopathy is. It's just compression of the spinal cord. So how does that actually present? Does it present with pain? No, that's the problem. You don't have any pain. What you have is you start gait instability and dexterity problems with your hands. So if you have difficulty buttoning your shirt, that is a symptom of cervical myelopathy. Patients, when they getting off a curb, they're like, wait a minute, they don't feel confident stepping down unless they hold something. So what's the problem with those two symptoms? It's kind of like just getting old, right? So all the time, cervical myelopathy isn't diagnosed because family members just feel like they're just getting old, where it's not. It's actually a condition that can be diagnosed and prevented if we get to it early. And that's what cervical myelopathy is. So again, that's how it presents. You drop objects with your hands. You know, we say your handwriting gets messy. I mean, my handwriting got so much messier in the last 10 years of life. You know, I'm not myelopathic, or I don't think I am. But so anyhow, so you have numbness and tingling in the extremities. You have hand, um, decreased hand dexterity, and you have this gait imbalance. And those are the symptoms of myelopathy. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's not painful. If it was painful, I would see these patients sooner and I could probably help them more, but you know, it's just not painful. So we can diagnose it pretty easy. Uh, one thing you do is if you sit down here, just put your leg out. You can't see it, just relax, relax, just relax. So this is a, a patella reflex. No, it's okay. You guys see it, when you do a patella reflex, the kicking, there's a normal reflex and there's hyper reflexivity. So the number one way to diagnose cervical myelopathy is that people are hyperreflexic. So if I went like this to them, they go like that. And right off the bat, within seconds, if somebody's having dexterity problems with their hands, gait instability, and I go like this and they go like that, I know that they have myelopathy, which is compression on the 101 that has to be either in the neck or their thoracic spine because your spinal cord ends right about here. Um, so that's cervical myelopathy. Now, I'm going to go through on how we treat this. Now, when we treat this, we either have to go in from the front or on the back uh, to treat this properly. Now, the goal is to decompress the spinal cord. Now, here, you guys can diagnose this. You can see that this patient has loss of CSF. So we got that stenosis on the 101 right down in the middle, and we have to treat that. Um, so how do we do it? Again, in terms of the treatment, this is slowly progressive. Age is slowly progressive. It goes one direction. So a radiculopathy improves on its own. This is slowly progressive, so you want to treat it early. There's only one treatment option. You got to decompress that spinal cord. That's it. A nerve root heals on its own. For cervical myelopathy, because it's a spinal cord, doesn't regenerate on its own, if it's compressed, we need to go fix it. Now, in the lumbar spine, here, your spinal cord ends right about here. In the lumbar spine, if you have stenosis in the lumbar spine, it's pinching of the peripheral nerves. Even though it's centrally, it's the same thing as pinching the C-word exit. So if you have stenosis in the lumbar spine, it's not that big of a deal. You can do epidural steroid injections, live with it, because it's not the spinal cord which the spinal cord, as you know from spinal cord injuries, it just is very unforgiving. So how do we treat it? So this is this concept, and this might be a little too technical, and now in the cervical spine, what did we say happens? You lose that lordosis. Now, this is the front of the neck. This is just an illustration showing the spinal cord when it's aligned. It drops right down the middle of that spinal canal. The spinal canal, these are the building blocks, bone, disc, bone, disc, bone, disc. This is the canal. So this is the beam that holds up the house. 
This is all the plumbing that goes in the walls. Now what happens when you get old? You lose that disc height and you drift into that kyphosis. The problem is when you drift into kyphosis, look what happens to the head. The head comes forward. So it starts pulling that spinal cord anteriorly against this ridge. The spinal cord is no longer sitting centrally in that canal. So what that means, okay, can you just go in and take off the spinous process in the back and decompress it and pull that away? No, it doesn't do anything because that spinal cord is being draped anteriorly. And that's why when we operate in the cervical spine, we need to get that spinal cord back into our lordosis to get, to get that spinal cord to drift back posteriorly away from those osteophytes. So these are the operations we do. We restore, we either take out those discs and put in those cages to get that back into our lordosis and get that spinal cord back in the center of that canal. And we either do multiple cages or combinations and so forth. So this is kind of how it looks in patients. When we evaluate these, we need to figure out, are they in lordosis? This is lordosis, the natural curve. Kyphosis is when you start drip, drifting forward. So we want to get them back so it's aligned so that spinal cord is going straight down the middle. You can see that this patient has nice straight alignment here, and there's only disc disease at one level. So here, that operation, you can see that he only has pinching on one level, and this is so that would be a pretty easy operation. We'd just go in and do that disc replacement or do the fusion from the front. Now here's another patient, again, lots of loss of disc height. So they've drifted into some kyphosis, but not too much. So the spinal cord is a little, you can see it's getting banged up on two levels. Stenosis at two levels there. So there would do another type of cage from the front. And you can see that here, we just did a cage with a plate. Now this is another patient you can see here that he have neutral alignment, but they have three levels of disease. Now when you operate from the front, it's perfect if there's one or two levels. But if there's multiple levels, three levels, then you just can't go do every level from the front. And then if they're Lord neutral, then you do it from the back. And this is where we went in, we just decompressed it from the back and did plates and screws from the back. Uh, now this is that example, that tough situation where somebody's really kyphotic, so the spinal cord's draping forward. So I can't just go in from the back because I gotta get that spinal cord back away. So this is where we go in from the front and we have to do a cage in the front to restore him, get him up neutral, get the spinal cord back. And because it's so many levels, then we have to actually do a, a posterior operation. So these are really technical things, you know, that you know, I just want you guys to kind of know what we do. Now, as a spine surgeon, I tell patients we do two things. I'm a carpenter in that if I'm working on the house, I got to keep the roof up. I got to keep your head up in the air. So a lot of what I do is just carpentry. It's screws, it's plates, it's if I take out a wall, I got to build it back up. That's the first thing I do. The second thing I do is I'm just the, the electrician, I'm the plumber. Behind that wall is all this wiring. And if I take out a wall, I got to put that wall back up and then put the plumbing back behind it. So here, whenever we do our carpentry, it's just a matter of like, you know, we talk about screw size, we talk about how the cortical, we talk about purchase. It's all about getting a screw in there that's in bone and isn't going to pull out, just like putting in a screw in a nice new two by four versus into an old rotted out piece of wood that isn't going to hold a screw. So in the cervical spine, we just have these different types of places where we put those screws to create these constructs. And you can see here that this is where the spinal cord is. This is where we put in screws posteriorly just into the bone. And these are the operations that we do. And it's really just carpentry. Um, and you know, these are other type of constructs that we use. Now, again, all these screws are done to get the bone to heal, to get that Elmer's glue to heal. It's the body's fusion that we're ultimately leading for and that the screws are really just holding things in place until that glue heals. After the glue heals, you could take the screws out, but we just don't bother doing so. Now this is another operation we sometimes do, and you might hear about this a little bit more. It's called a, a laminoplasty. In this situation, we just open up the spinal cord so there's more space in there for the stenosis. And here all we do is we make a little divot on one side of this posterior arch. 
we hinge it open, and then we just put a plate on it to keep it open, and that means that spinal cord has more space in there. You know, I kind of went through this stuff on cervical myelopathy, but, you know, that's, that's the take-home message that I want, and I, I, I give this talk a lot to primary care physicians. If somebody has a pinched nerve, unilateral arm pain, it's okay if the, their patients are probably better off if they don't see me, you know, because eventually they're, they're gonna get better. But for cervical myelopathy, I tell primary care physicians, if people are losing their ability to ambulate, losing their balance, having dexterity problems in their hands, they need to be a spine surgeon because we can really make these patients better if we get to them early. But if we wait too long, it's hard to fix. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit. I'm gonna, we only have a few more minutes, uh, and I'm just gonna talk about fractures. Now, the cervical spine, you know, bone health is really important. You know, for you and your parents and your family members, it really gets important, fall prevention. And fall prevention is these really little things. It is making sure you don't have rugs in the house that you can trip on. When you go to the bathroom at night, it's railings. These are the things that really, I, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna scare you into it. It's a difference between life and death in patients after a certain age. You need to change the rugs in your house. You need to move things so you can't slip. Because the problem is if you get a hip fracture at a certain age or a neck fracture, it's kind of like this life force that we have where it's like when things start going the wrong way, they kind of stack up and they take away that life force and they take away that activity. So if you lose ground on activity with a hip fracture or a neck fracture, even though we can get you better, you're never quite where you're at. And we know that from all the evidence. The point being is that a lot of effort should go into preventing these fragility <coughs> fractures, these falls, and you know, just doing little things around the house like better lighting in the bathroom. You know, when you get up at night to go to the bathroom, you need to make sure that there's railings near the bathroom. You have no idea how many patients fall, come in with fractures, and they're like, it's something like, you know, there was a rug, or it's always the same stuff that could have been prevented. Um, so that's important. So I think that's pretty much it for the, the formal part of the talk. I'll be right up here. People can come up and ask questions.